All right, thank you all for joining us again today. Today is uh, June the 20th and uh, you're meeting with the International Association of Wood Carvers. Uh, this page has been created by Carvers for Car Carvers so that we can share uh, information among each other um, during this pandemic and time when we can't get together for classes and uh, meetings and things. Uh, today we're privileged to have Dale Kirkpatrick with us. Uh, Dale is coming from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and uh, he's been around the carving community for quite some time. Uh, Dale's been carving uh, pumpkins, toothpick holders, golf balls, and today he's gonna to do a demonstration on wooden spools. Um, so I think he's gonna have some slides to show us and then also do a demonstration or a brief demonstration. Uh, next week, we will have Gene Messer on. Uh, for those of you who are fairly new, Gene uh, does a lot of YouTube videos uh, for beginners. Uh, he does some flat plane carving and he's going to come on and talk about his uh, carving journey and um, talk a little bit about the flat plane carvings that he does in the videos. Um, I want to let everybody know and I'll remind you again later on in the meeting that uh, the 4th of July is coming up and I know everybody on here is not from the United States but um, we will be taking off for the 4th of July. We won't have a meeting that Saturday uh, and then we'll pick back up on the 11th at the same time at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so just be aware of that and we'll also post that on our Facebook page and Instagram pages so everybody knows. Uh, so at this time I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dale Kirkpatrick for his presentation and I think Dale's going to open it up also for some questions and some conversation time. Uh, so Dale thank you again for joining us and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, share a little bit about what I've been doing with spools since probably the early 80s. Uh, so I'll tell you about my experience. Uh, I'll tell you where I, where I came by my spools, uh, how, many I, how many spools I have, and actually show you some pictures of, of my spools, T talk to you a little bit about the choice of patterns that I, that I uh, pick. And uh, then near the end, I plan on doing uh, a little demonstration of how I lay out the, uh, the project that I'm gonna do on the spool and actually rough it a little bit um, I talked to Larry earlier this week and he suggested that I have one completed uh, because I don't want to turn this thing into a carving class. Uh, might take a little bit more time than everybody has, but uh, at least you'll see when I start roughing out what it's going to look like when I get done. So maybe, maybe you can make the leap from the, from the roughing out to the finished product. I also use uh, Howard's feed and wax. So I'll put some Howard's feed and wax on the uh, on the completed one. But I haven't put anything on it yet. So you'll see how I do that. Nothing magical about that, but that completes the process. So you'll you'll get to see that too. Uh, so I got I got started carving spools because it was a guy in our carving club, an old timer. Uh, and he would talk about how uh, he would take his wife to the, to the doctors or hairdresser, and then he'd have to sit in the waiting room. And since he was a carver, he decided it would be very convenient if he just took a spool along with him and a pocket knife, and he would whittle on a spool while he was there. So he produced some, some spools, and uh, they were pretty interesting. He's no longer with us, but he did give he did give me one. Uh, I'll show it to you later when I get the camera and we can do close up there. This is kind of a geometric, it's a Pacific Island looking thing. He was a, an engineer type guy. So it's all perfect on both sides. I don't know how he did that. He must, must have spent more time measuring than he did carving. But uh, I thought I'd give it a try. So I still have some old spools from from back in the 80s, and they're pretty pathetic. I didn't even bring any to show you. Uh, but I'll, I'll caution you against some of the pitfalls that, that I uh, fell into when I, was, when I started. Uh, 
Um, I'll do that later on when I when I get into my demonstration. Uh, oh, before we go any further, I want to tell you that this is just carving. I mean, there's nothing magical about spools. It's still wood. Uh, might be a different variety of wood than you're used to, to working with, but uh, it's still wood. If you have a walking stick, you know, that you picked up along the trail somewhere, it's going to be, I hope it's going to be round and it'll be very similar to a spool and you could carve a, uh, a face using the same techniques in that walking stick. I mean, it's just the same, same as a spool, it's just round. Uh, a lot of the walking sticks that I did though, I put long flowing beards on them. Well, that's pretty hard to do when you're restricted to the, the uh, length of a spool, but uh, still the, the face, is, it's, it's the same carving. Uh, and I'll mention that I do mostly faces. Uh, I've seen people on, on Facebook that they post pictures of carved spools and it's just amazing what some people have done. There's some guy that, that I think his permanent resident is a, uh, an RV and he travels around the States. I, I, don't, I don't know his name. I, I tried to get in touch with him on Facebook. He didn't respond. Um, he, he carves a tremendous amount of spools and I didn't see a face in one of them. He does all kinds of things like kitchens, stoves and refrigerators, uh, a tree with a swing, just anything you can imagine he's carved into a spool. Um, I don't do that sort of stuff. I, I restrict my carving to, to faces and uh, maybe some little figures. I have, I have a slide with some figures that you can see what I've done. But you don't feel that you have to carve faces. You can carve anything you want. Um, a lot of people start with Santa Clauses. I see a lot of carved Santas at flea markets and craft shows and things like that. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. You don't have to be very creative. You just put a red hat on and a white beard and, and uh, maybe tie a bow on the top of it and turn it into an ornament. Uh, but I, I use the spools to, to practice. So I practice faces and uh, I, I might be taking a class and I'll be carving with some instructor that has a, uh, a go by that has a particular face on it that I think is interesting. After I get done with the class, I'll go and try to carve it into a spool just because it's, it might be something that I haven't carved before, just an expression or something unusual about it. So, uh, I think that's, that's all I need to tell you about that for now. Um, when I first started, I, I, had, I had a spool and I carved it. I must have got it from my mother because she was a seamstress. And uh, I would show it to people and they would say, wow, would you carve one of those for me? And I would say, well, I don't have any spools. If, if you have two, you could give me two. I'll carve one and give it back to you. So I would keep one and I would carve it and then I'd have another carved one. So I, I did that for, I don't know, a year or so. And that's how I was accumulating my spools. But in the meantime, word got out and people started just giving me spools, especially people that already had one that was carved. They would say, you don't have to carve another one for me. Here's just a, a, a bag full of spools or a jar full of spools or whatever. Um, so I, I started accumulating them. I, I can tell you I have uh, in the neighborhood of 4,200 spools. I started, I, I sat down one day, they were all squirreled away when people give me a little baggie full of spools. I just throw it up on the shelf somewhere, tuck it back in between two other things and forget it was there. So there was a lady that, that offered to sell me some spools and I thought, well, I'm not gonna start paying for spools if I, if, I, if I have a lot, maybe I should figure out how many I have. So I, I think I spent uh, January, whole month, uh, a couple of years ago, just going through all my shelves and digging around and looking for 
all the spools I had and I kind of categorized them. I'll go through those categories and uh, I have some pictures of, of uh, spools from each of the categories. But uh, it turns out that I, I have over 4,000. Uh, and I, I'm not, I don't plan on carving them all. <laughs> don't send me any spools. I don't need any spools. Uh, some of them are small. They're like an inch and an eighth or smaller. And I've carved that, that size. I would recommend to anyone who wants to give this a shot to find spools that are uh, two inches or two and a quarter or two and an eighth you know, larger, larger spools to give you some area to work on. Uh, and then if you, if you want the challenge of carving something small, then you can, you can go to a smaller spool. You'll probably find the smaller ones, more smaller ones than you find bigger ones when, when you go and look. I see them in flea markets and antique malls and uh, <laughs> when I go to the flea market sometimes I'll, I'll take a pocket full of carved ones and then I'll find somebody that has uh, a basket full of spools and I'll say, uh, uh, would you be interested in trading? And this is what I do with them. And when they see the carved ones, they get all excited and, and uh, I walk away with a bag full of spools and I just had to give up one. So uh, that's, how, that's how I get some of mine in the meantime. Uh, as far as the, the prices for them, I think you'll, you'll find that people feel that spools are a lot more valuable than you think they are. Uh, they have pretty high opinions of, of the value of their spools. They want $2 for a spool. Well, that's, I, I just spin on my heel and, and walk away. That, that's just ridiculous. Uh, maybe 10 cents. Of course, keep in mind I have 4,000, so the, the value is, is, is lower for me, but uh, if you can only find someone who's selling them for a buck or maybe a jar full of, of spools that have uh, a variety of sizes and maybe there are 18 spools in there and, and they want 20 bucks, uh, that, that might be worth it for you if, if you want to give it a try. Uh, if you really get into it, then you might be concerned about the price and, and start looking for cheaper sources. But uh, if, you can, if you can find some uh, people that are up in, in years that have been car or have been uh, sewing for many, many years, they probably have a bushel basket of them somewhere because I find people don't want to throw them away. Even if they don't have any idea what they're going to use them for, they know they're good for something and they don't want to get rid of them. So they hold on to them. And uh, sometimes that works in my favor because they find out what, what I do with them. And then they just say, well, here, I've been waiting for you. And uh, then I just get buried under more spools. But uh, you, can, uh, you can check the flea markets and, and uh, antique malls and, and see what you can find. Uh, I prefer the ones that still have the, the labels on them because that proves that they're authentic spools. There are uh, craft companies that, that are using the same machinery, I understand. I think it's up in Maine, Maine. Uh, and they make basswood thread spools. And they're really easy to carve, as you can imagine. But uh, I call them counterfeit spools. I like the ones that have the labels, the paper labels on them, or you'll find some that, that have uh, labels uh, pressed into them. And uh, I, those are the ones that I prefer. Uh, so I can tell you that I have my categories. Uh, the first category is small. So that's like, an, an inch and an eighth, and that would be like 28 millimeters for you people that are uh, metrically oriented. Um, I got, I got to have over 2,000 of those. And I, I, I'll carve one every once in a while, maybe just for variety, but uh, they're pretty static. They're, they're just sitting there. Uh, 
the larger ones I have, that would be larger than uh, inch and an eighth, 28 millimeter. I, I have about a thousand of those. So when I go to carve one, I have, uh, I have a big box that I root through to, to find, find the perfect spool for me to carve for a particular pattern. I'll talk more about that later. Um, the thread companies, some of them, uh, or maybe all of them, I'm not sure, uh, produced spools and they painted them. So I have spools that have the labels on them and they're, they're right from the spool factory and they're painted red, they're painted blue, they're painted orange, green, black, and white. Uh, I don't particularly care for those because when you carve it, uh, especially if you're carving a face on it, uh, the part that you don't carve has color on it then and it just kind of takes away from the, uh, from the impact of it being a face. I, I, my intent usually is when I carve a face is to turn the spool into a head uh, instead of doing a relief carving on the side of the spool. So with all that paint, uh, and it, it doesn't come off. I've tried to bleach it off and uh, it, it'll carve off, but I'm, I'm not crazy about spending time carving the paint off of a spool when I already have spools that are paint free. Uh, but the white ones, I have 139 of those in various colors. And the other ones that are the, the list that I gave you, orange, black, blue, green, all those, I have uh, about 136 of those. You'll see those in a picture I have coming up here. Plus the, another category I have is spools that still have thread on them. Uh, I don't want to take the thread off, mainly because I don't need the spools without thread because I have plenty without. And a lot of people I see make craft things out of thread spools that have the, the colored thread on them. So uh, maybe someday I'll come across someone who's interested in doing craft work with, with those kind of spools. Uh, so I just, I just leave the thread on them. I fasten it so it doesn't come unwound. Uh, that's really annoying when I get a bag of spools that have thread on them. They're all, it's all unwinding and it's all tangled up in, in, uh, in its neighbor spool and it's a mess. Uh, I, I'll talk about, I'll mention about the thread now. Uh, they, they stopped making wooden spools in the 70s. So if you have a, a wooden thread spool that has cotton thread on it, now if, if it has silk thread on it, you're good to go. That thread is still good. Silk thread seems to be uh, uh, impervious to time, but cotton thread will rot. So uh, that's another good reason to leave the, the, the thread on there for, uh, for decorative purposes. Uh, you can't really use that thread uh, it, it's, you, it's easy to test it. You just pull on it and if it snaps, you know it's, it's not usable. You put it in a sewing machine, it's going to break before you get three or four stitches going. So uh, if someone tells you that thread spools are more valuable uh, with the thread on them, uh, I wouldn't go with that. Uh, I also have what I, I call my collection. <laughs> After I started going through all these and getting so many thread spools, I noticed that there was a huge variety of them. So I tried to squirrel away one of a kind, you know, one of each kind. And uh, so far I have 176 different, different thread spools. You will see a picture of that coming up. Uh, that's, that's a drop in the bucket compared to, to what the industry has produced over uh, a century of making spools. Uh, there was one, uh, one thread company on, on the internet, I've done some research and uh, there was an article about one company in 1875, that was when the article was written. And uh, they had 1200 different patterns of thread spools. So, uh, 
mine doesn't doesn't hold a candle to that that size of a collection. But uh, nevertheless, they're interesting to see different shapes and sizes of them. Uh, I don't know how many I have that are carved. Uh, not not a whole lot. Uh, I have a spool rack that I I'm trying to fill up, and it must maybe it has ten rows of six, or six rows of ten, or something. Maybe it holds sixty spools. So I'm still in the process of trying to make sixty unique spools for to fill up that rack, and then maybe it'll sit out in my way and get dusty. Uh, right now they they just live in a box. So uh, I think I'm going to share some pictures with you now and talk about some of the some of the spools that uh, that I, I've collected and that I've carved. So we'll see if this works. There we go. Everybody see that? Okay, I am getting the thumb up thumbs up from Blake. I can't hear anybody. So I yes, guess if, if, if you have any questions, I guess you can uh, type them in and then Blake can accumulate them or Tom can accumulate them and, and uh, break in when it's appropriate. So this is just, I, I decided to, to put some examples of variety out on a table and take a picture. This isn't all of my collection, but you can see that uh, the, there's, there's an assortment of sizes and shapes. Some of them have real skinny uh, bodies to them. They're always a challenge to carve because you're limited to the amount of wood. Uh, some of them have uh, uh, suture thread on them. Pick one of those up at a flea market. They had a case of, of uh, medical suture thread, so I bought one spool of it. I don't even remember how much I paid. It wasn't very much. Uh, but you can you can see a lot of the, the tiny little ones there are from sewing kits. And people would people would like to uh, challenge me and give me a tiny little spool and, and say, I bet you can't carve this one. And uh, sometimes I could and sometimes I'd give up. But some of them are pretty small that I've done. You'll you may see some of those in the slides. I can't remember. Uh, the ones in the back row, a couple of them have thread. One has white thread and the other one has kind of a purplish thread. Uh, they're, they must be industrial material. Uh, there are a couple of different kinds of uh, thread spools, to, to basically two categories. One for home use and ones for uh, uh, industrial use or the weaving industry. So they make these big bobbins, which I'll show you here in a couple of minutes, uh, that hold a lot of thread and they're, they're gigantic. Um, also good for carving, as you'll see. Um, I did, an, another thing, uh, I bought these big thread spools just because they, were, they had their labels on them and uh, they were large, unusually large. I don't ever expect to take the thread off, but I have no idea what size the wood is inside. I thought I'd find a windfall every once in a while. There'd be a, a box of spools and it'd be really cheap that had thread on them. And so I bought them and uh, took the thread off of one of them. There was hardly any wood inside. It was such a skinny little waist. So uh, I, that, didn't, that didn't help me too much. Uh, oh, let's go. This, if I can get my. There we go. Uh, this is just a close up of what you saw on the table, just one side. So you can you can see the the labels on some of them. Some of them have press labels. You can see in this this shot. This is the other side of the table. Uh, These are, this is the box that I have my thread, uh, spools with threads in. So you can see, you can imagine there's just any shade of any color you could, you could want in a, a spool of thread. Uh, they manufactured it. So 
I kind of keep them in plastic bags so they don't uh, absorb any moisture. Nothing worse than a, a spool that has mildew on it. These are the painted ones that I was telling you about. You can see the green, blue, and red at the top. Uh, I don't see any orange ones in there, but they're in there somewhere. The ones at the bottom don't look like they're painted at all, but they have a white, a white coating of paint on them. So uh, you can see they come in, in large and small sizes. This is uh, one of the two boxes. This is a bigger box uh, that I have of my larger spools. So this is the one I go to to sort through to find a spool I'm going to carve something in. This one are the inch and an eighth and smaller. And I can tell you that there are 1,300 spools in that box. And believe it or not, it's heavy. Uh, but I, I hardly ever get into that. The only reason I got into that this time was to take the picture to, to show you guys. So these are uh, two of the ones that were on the table in the first shot that you saw. They're, uh, uh, the biggest one is six and three eighths inches long. And the, uh, the one without thread, the big one is six inches long. That's 153 millimeter. Uh, the first one's 162 millimeter. And then the little one in the middle, it's, uh, it's half an inch. It actually will fit in the hole <laughs> in the, uh, the spool that doesn't have any thread on it. The hole is big enough for that, that little tiny spool to fit into it. So I thought that was kind of curious. So I decided to share that. So this is the uh, family portrait. You see the little two little spools on the bottom row in the front. They're uh, they're probably the smallest I've carved. They're a real challenge to to find an interesting face to put in that that short amount of uh, wood. Uh, You can see there's a variety. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time uh, combing through Pinterest to see faces, interesting faces, uh, some of the sketchbooks that people post on uh, Pinterest are uh, a good source for, for expressions. So I'll give it a try, see what happens. If it doesn't work out, you never get to see it. So uh, you can also kind of recognize some of the shapes of the spools that flare out at the top. They were probably skinnier in the center. Some of the ones that go straight up and down there, they were pretty fat, a lot of material there to work with. Uh, this, this shot, shows the ones that I've done that have whole figures and they're carved in the round. Not all my heads uh, are carved in the round. Sometimes they're just on the front. So I don't have a shot of the back of these, but some of them are holding sticks or canes. I guess the one guy on the top, he's holding a, a cane in both of his hands. Uh, you might recognize a couple of these from Don Mertz. He does tiny little hobbits and dwarves and things. So I try to transfer those into spools and I kind of look like his, but his are, uh, his are more refined than mine, I think. So here are a few more close-ups here. I, I'm a big fan of uh, Tom Richmond, the caricature, caricature artist. So I've been known to go to his book and look at uh, caricatures that he's drawn. Some I've, I've uh, borrowed from his Facebook posts. And uh, 
something, uh, my, my copying skills, I'd like to have a, a picture or a model to look at when I, when I do a spool, do a face. Um, it's, just, it's just easier for me. I can't make these things up uh, out of my head. So I like something to look at. And I'll have to tell you that there's no way anybody's going to get me for a copyright infringement because none of mine look exactly like the ones I'm trying to use as models. So uh, don't, don't be disappointed if you don't come up with yours looking exactly like you, uh, like you expected. This shot I took, I did these three recently. Uh, I put this up because I wanted to, sh to show you the different kinds of results you get from the possible different kinds of wood. I believe these are all the same kind of wood, although the one in the middle that's really light carved very easily. It was so easy to carve, I had to be careful that, uh, that it just didn't split away. Make very deliberate cuts with a very sharp knife. Uh, but it was just the spool. So the only finish that you see on here, with, with the exception of the guy with the mustache, I, uh, I used a felt tip pen to color that, darken that. But those all just have Howard's feed and wax on them. So that's the color that the wood uh, gave me in response to the feed and wax. So I, I haven't talked about the kinds, kinds of wood yet, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a few minutes. This is just another, uh, another example of some of the patterns that I've come up with. Uh, you can see the one on the left has had a very narrow waist. So I kind of took advantage of that and made him, gave him a big jaw. Uh, and you can carve glasses on them. I guess now would be a good time to talk about how deep you can actually go. That was one of the, one of the uh, criticisms of myself when I look back at my early spools. I was just carving on the surface. I'll have to admit that I, I have carved deeply enough to fall into the center hole uh, that's drilled through the spool. Uh, sometimes I use that to my advantage and it, he'll, happen, he'll have an open mouth then, or maybe she'll have an open mouth depending on uh, what the face is. Uh, you also have to be careful if you've ever carved a face in a pumpkin, uh, just the, not the old fashioned jack-o'-lantern kind, but the ones with, where it's more of a relief carving and uh, you're getting into the inside corners of the eyes next to the nose, you could, uh, in the case of carving a spool, you could fall into that hole. Um, those, those aren't worth keeping either, so I don't bother holding on to those after I've uh, put that fatal flaw in them. These are what I call bobbins. And I don't know whether that's an official industry term or not, but uh, the, the tallest one is 13 and 5 eighths. It's, it's pretty big. I have it here if you, can, if you can. Oh, you probably can't see my, my screen because we're doing screen share. I'll show you that later. Oh, which is uh, 146 millimeter for the uh, Canadians and Europeans in our group. Uh, 34 and a half centimeters. The, uh, the middle one is, uh, uh, let's see, it's six inches tall and it's 34, no, nope, it's 254 millimeters. The small one, that's the smallest bobbin that I have, it has real fine thread on it. It's six inches long. Middle one's 10 inches, I'm sorry. Middle one's 10 inches. This, the little one is six inches, it's 153 millimeters. And you can carve uh, faces on those. I like to do Santas and then I kind of tint them red and 
and their Christmas decoration mood. The bigger one, you would think that the wood would be really hard, but it's been my experience that the lanolin from the, maybe the wool that was used on the bobbin has, uh, for so many years, has penetrated the, the wood and it's not too hard to carve. It, it makes it a little easier, especially on the surface for all the deeper I'm going. I've never carved any bobbins like this any deeper than what you see. Uh, this I, I wanted to show you. I just did this last week uh, because I wanted to, to show you uh, my inspiration. So I was looking through uh, Pinterest, pictures in Pinterest, and I saw this picture and I decided, well, I don't have any spools like that, carved spools like that. So I dug around, found a spool that had a long, thin uh, middle to it. And I decided that that's what I would do. What I didn't realize was when I got done, the, uh, the face itself turned out to only be uh, three quarters of an inch wide, which is smaller than, than I would have really chosen to carve a face in. So uh, I made the best of it that I could. It's not really that balanced, but uh, you can still see the, uh, the uh, expression and the, and the features to it. So uh, as we, we move along here, I, I have a, uh, I have a slide next. I want to point this out to you. I'll mention it later when I start laying out, uh, demonstrating the layout of the spool. You can see the grain in this very easily. Uh, it's not always this easy to see the grain, but what I'm going to tell you is that you, you should make every effort to find the grain, see which direction it's going. And uh, like uh, Mr. Stetson will tell you, you want to start from the outside of the tree. You want to use that grain pattern to your advantage. So if you, uh, if you draw your center line at the, the point, it's the widest in that, that arc, that would be the closest to the camera. Uh, then when you carve on both sides of the center line, you'll, you'll pretty much have the same experience, the carving experience. You won't be cutting directly into the end of the grain, like if, if you chose some other spot on the, on the spool for your center. Uh, this is, uh, maybe, you can, maybe you can see my center line. Sorry, I couldn't get a bigger picture for you. Um, I, uh, a couple of years ago, quite a few years ago, uh, in 2010, I did an article for Carving Magazine, and this was the this was the start of the project in that magazine. So you can see how I I laid it out and and showed what I was about to do. That was the finished project in the magazine. So uh, it happens to be. Uh, Issue number 31, it's fall of 2010. If anybody uh, has magazines that go back that far and you're interested in, in finding a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial. And uh, that takes care of my slideshow. So I'm back, I guess. Am I still screen sharing? No. Can you see me in my wood pile there? Yeah, we see you, Dale. Okay. Uh, so uh, the kinds of wood, people always ask what kind of wood it is. Uh, I've just anyone who's had any amount of experience of, or a fair amount of carving experience will know that not all basswood carves exactly the same. So it, it's hard for me to say, all these spools are made out of the same kind of wood because some are hard and some are soft. Uh, the ones that are really hard 
Uh, I don't need the aggravation of that. I just toss those. Some of them are so soft, like I mentioned on that one, that I, I, I just throw those away too. They're just too soft to deal with. So uh, what I've, I've found on the internet doing some uh, historical research was they used mostly white birch. Uh, it, was, it was native to up in New England where the thread mills were. Uh, the thread mills had their own uh, shops that, that created their own spools so they could design their own shapes and, and have their own people turn them out. Uh, they would have the local farmers go out to their woodlots and uh, in the fall they would cut down birch trees, little sticks and trees and whatever, and in whatever sizes they required, and they would uh, deliver them to the factory and they would put them in uh, storage to age and dry. And then they would uh, later on, a couple of years later, they would uh, turn them into, into spools. But they were, they did use sycamore, I found out. They used alder, they used ash, um, which can be hard. They make baseball bats out of ash. Um, they used beech. And if you know these woods, uh, they're all light colored. I thought, well, maybe that was the reason that they, they chose those species, but the, that theory goes down the drain when they started painting them red and blue. So I, I, don't, I don't know, I guess it was just availability and uh, they were cranking them out on lathes. So the lathe could, could cut pretty much any, uh, any species of wood. Uh, I, I can tell you that these, all these species of wood are pretty well closed cell grain. So you don't have, uh, if you've ever done any work with uh, oak, you can see how the thread might catch on the open pores of the uh, or the open cells of the of the wood. But all these cells are, or all these spools turn out to be smooth, uh, and they made a tremendous, a mind-boggling amount of of spools. This article that I was telling you about uh, from uh, the the company in uh, in Connecticut back in uh, 1875 or whenever that article was written, they, they would make 10,000 dozen spools a day. They needed that many, 10,000 dozen. Uh, so they were, they were really cranking them up. That was just one company at one point in, in time. There were a lot of, a lot of thread companies, kind of hard to keep track of them because they would, uh, they would merge, they would buy one another out. And uh, so you see quite a variety of uh, labels of brand names on the spools. Uh, one, one, uh, one odd thing, the American Thread Company was owned by a British company, but it was called the American Thread Company. Uh, okay. Um, we talked a little bit about the choice of patterns and uh, uh, because I've carved so many, I'm always looking for them, always looking for a variety, looking, uh, I told you in Pinterest and magazines or TV or anywhere I can find a, a new face. Uh, oh, let's see, a lot of these things I've already mentioned. I kind of shy away from fearsome looking faces or nasty looking expressions, although I have done a few of those. Uh, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at an expression as a candidate for a carving, you have to think about the hairstyle, whether, whether he's gonna have hair, uh, whether uh, the shape of the mouth, what the expression might be, what features, that would be on the face, whether he's gonna have ears or not, uh, glasses. So a lot of times I'll choose the face and then go looking for the spool that fits it. 
but uh, I have been known to see a, a spool that's an interesting uh, shape or something, and then I'll go look for the for an expression to carve on it. So uh, it's important to to lay out your your face. Many times I've uh, I've been ready to carve the mouth and the chin, and there's no space left because I started at the top and uh, and left too much space for the eyes and the hair or whatever. So it's a good idea to plan ahead. Uh, I think now it's time to uh, do the do the demo here. What I've done. If we can put me in the waiting room. And while you're doing that, Dale, I'm going to go ahead and remind everybody next week we'll have uh, Gene Messer on to talk about his YouTube videos and uh, talk about flat plane carving and tell us about his carving journey. Uh, we will be off July the 4th, so there'll be no meeting on July the 4th. Uh, and then we'll meet back up again on the 11th of July uh, and continue our meetings from there. So. Um, hopefully you can join us next week at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and then again, after that, we won't meet again until the 11th. Okay, so, uh, Tom, can you, can you get, can you get my session up? All I'm seeing is uh, Blake. No, you're you're on there uh, now. Okay, I I can't see it on my uh, my camera though. Let's see, maybe it's something. Your, I'm your calipers, your calipers are at the bottom of the screen, Dale. Yeah, I I can see that. I can see that. Uh, okay, well, I was hoping to be able to to use the camera screen, but this is an iPhone, so I was hoping to be able to use that. To, to check me to, to check my work to see how I was uh, in frame or not, but there's a tiny little thumbnail there that I can watch. Uh, okay, well let's, let me talk about the, the tools that I'm that I'm going to use. And for this project, uh, uh, I I uh, I have five six, five, six seven, eight about eight tools. Uh, most of them are gouges. Uh, yeah, they're all gouges. Most of them are deep. One's a shallow gouge, no V tools, and I use a knife. Uh, these are the these are the shapes that I use. I don't know where is that in focus. Uh, so uh, I have some uh, Swiss tools, and I have a couple of dock yards. The small ones are dock yards and a couple of Ramelsons. So this is, the, this is the, the finished example that I'm going for here. This is really annoying because I was planning on zooming. All I can see is Bob Soderholm. Try shifting over to your swiping to your uh, right, and that might bring you in. Okay, well now I've done it. Now I've changed the, there we go. Need to un unmute uh, Dale. We can't hear you. Dale, can you hit unmute? It's not. Uh, I can't unmute you on this end. I think it may be on his phone. Yeah. How's that? There you go. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Working with this iPhone is uh, is a little tedious. Uh, I need to invest in a real camera, I guess. Okay, so 
this is the this is our uh, target project here. I have a a spool that's the uh, same size, same dimensions. Before I go any further, I wanted to give you a close up of uh, of my mentor's uh, spool. And, and he didn't care about the labels. So he has some Naga hide or something on the top and the bottom. This, this is one of these blue spools that I talked to about. It was painted from the factory. And this is what it looks like. Almost looks like it, uh, he's wearing a wimple or something. So um, it's just not my, not my favorite thing to carve. Okay, so to, to lay, it, lay out the spool, uh, we have, we put a center line in and uh, make sure you, you start it way at the top. If I can get this pen to work, there we go. Remember, remember how I said, consider the grain, grain pattern. And you wanna mark it all the way at the top. Now I do this in pencil, I'm doing it in pen so you can see it on the, on the camera so the pencil mark will be easy to to erase but uh, if you don't go all the way to the top you're going to be up here carving down here carving and you'll carve your center line off and maybe forget to to draw it back in and then then you'll lose your bearings so uh, i'm gonna this guy has uh, ears so i'm going to reserve some space for the ears um, i'm going to put his eye line right here so I'm using the uh, the finger running along the edge of the spool method. And that'll be the top of the ear and approximately where the eye is gonna be uh, at, the, at the bottom. And this will be the bottom of the nose. And then the ears should be halfway back on the head. Uh, also, uh, keep in mind that the standard proportions for the head do not apply when you're working on a spool. Uh, this is just, this is gonna be a, a barrel head sort of a, a guy. Um, so you don't have to, you don't have to uh, worry about the proportion of the the height of the face to the depth of the head uh, that that's all uh, out the window on on these projects so you want the ear to be halfway uh, halfway back on the head so I usually just put my thumbnail on that center line and then I spin it around until that line disappears and I can see where my thumbnail is and then I just eyeball right in the center of that space from this side to this side. So that's the center. Now, it's, it's not that important if you're off uh, 16th of an inch either way. The important thing is that you get the other ear laid out the same way. So you can either take a little strip of paper and, and mark on the paper at this point, and then mark on the paper at this point, then just wrap the paper around the other side, or you can put a compass. This is a little tricky going on a, uh, a curved surface, but measure over there, and then you can come over here and put a little mark, and then that's the front of your ear on this side. So I'll just, Kind of make them that wide, eyeball it over here. So there we have it. And the nose will, will fall in this area here. This is this is done just so you can get the get an idea of what happens when you actually start cutting these things. If you're gonna do a face, that's fine. If you're not you'll at least see how uh, 
how the tool goes through the wood. Now, what I have here is a Swiss made uh, six millimeter. It's a number nine, I believe, number nine. And I'm gonna go above the ear. So this guy doesn't have any hair. He's just, uh, he doesn't even have any eyebrows, not a hair on his head. So I'm just going to start carving. You can see that. And I'm carving above the ear. When I get deep enough, it's not going to want to cut. So I'm going to cut up into the flared part of the spool to give myself some more room. And what I'm doing is blocking out the ear, basically. I can do that on the bottom too. So we'll come across on the other side. If you want to go deeper and it's not letting you go deeper because of the tool you have, you can switch it out and go with a narrower tool. And now you can get a nice shelf on the top of there. You see his ears are sticking out from his head. And the, uh, the space where his eyes are going to go, they're going to go in here. And it looks like there's a huge amount of space between the center line and his ear. To put that eye in there, uh, it's not going to turn out that way because by the time you get deeply into the, the, the wood, you're reducing the, the distance because the line was out further. So uh, you can see I have pretty big eyes in there, but they come real close to the ears, which isn't a realistic uh, position for the eyes. So um, I can hear Dave Stetson sitting back there saying, that's all wrong, that's all wrong. But uh, people like my spools, so that's that's how I do them. And and nobody uh, nobody knows enough about anatomy to notice the, the things that aren't correct. So that that just kind of gives you an idea. We can do under the ear here. I'd like to keep this into a, an hour's time frame, but. I'm gonna run a little over, I think. So this is in front of the ear. So now you can see the face is, is starting to narrow. Uh, might as well use my knife while I'm here, LV, LV knife. Uh, I, I'm not gonna kid you, I have done spools and left the point of my knife in some of the spools. It does not work very well to have a knife blade that flexes. You're much better off uh, carving with a, a pretty rigid blade, like uh, a healthy rough out knife is, uh, is pretty rigid. So we can, you can see how the ear now protrudes from the side of the face. Hey Dale, if, uh, if you get into a spool and you find out it's really hard, is there anything you can do to try to soften it up while you're carving it? I've, I've never, uh, never even tried to tell you the truth. If it's too hard, I just, I don't bother with it. I just, uh, I fire it. I, I just send it on its way. Uh, there's, I, I have no use for it. Uh, so uh, it's, it's anyone who's ever carved a face will will recognize the steps that you go through. I mean, this is not this is not groundbreaking stuff here. I'm not uh, teaching you how to carve. This is this is stuff that people do all the time. Under the nose, uh, you need to relieve under the nose to get the uh, nose to protrude. And then, you, you know, 
you do up the side of the nose. So I'm not going to go any further on it than this since we have this one already finished. But what I'm going to do is use the, uh, oh, let me tell you this. I do use dockyard tools uh, for the details, but certainly not for the roughing out. Do not destroy your dockyard tools and then come back to me and tell me that I gave you some bad advice. I use the, the dockyards, these tiny little gouges to do the details on the ears, to put the, uh, the creases in the ears, and they're not anatomically correct either, but it gives you some shadows and it suggests that it's the right shape for an ear. Uh, for the eyeballs, uh, since I don't paint my carvings, I like to carve the iris, so I'll find a dockyard tool that will just fit between the lids and I'll, I'll push that in there and then relieve the wood from the iris side of it. And then I can do that on the other side. Both sides will be the same size iris that, that way. Uh, but it's a very delicate cut. You push straight in, no prying, no twisting. You don't want to do that with, uh, with dockyard tools. Also the nostrils. You can just do a quick little push straight in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even lever it in like that. I'd just get lined up here, get a bite on the wood and then push straight in. And, uh, and that way your dockyard tools will last a long time. Uh, so let me get my, uh, my feed and wax, show you what it looks like when the wax hits it. I don't know whether we're gonna have any dramatic effect here or not. Oh, I wanted to tell you, some people don't know what Howard, Howard's feed and wax looks like. So this is the bottle. You can buy it at uh, antique stores that's used on furniture. You can probably buy it at regular furniture stores. I think Home Depot might sell it, Lowe's, those places like that. Uh, what I've done over here, I, I have a, 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 a kid's paintbrush. These are sold like $2 for two dozen. So uh, that's, that's what I use to slop it on. You don't need a, a sophisticated sable brush or anything to get this wax from the bottle onto the wood. Uh, since I'm just doing little areas, this size brush uh, works just fine. But what I've done, so I don't have to go looking all over for a brush, and making sure that my brush that has wax on it doesn't rub off onto something else. I've taken a soda straw, bent over the bottom, tucked it up underneath, and then taped it on the side of the bottle. So when I'm done, I can just, I can just take that and drop it in. And then that's there waiting for me the next time I need to, need to spool. I need to mix up the wax because if it gets, uh, if it cools down, sometimes it'll solidify. So we'll see what kind of uh, coloration we get, change here we get. You can see it's getting darker. Another thing I'll, I'll mention is uh, this has beeswax in it. It's hard to find liquid wax or paste wax that doesn't have beeswax in it. And the only reason I'd be concerned about that is my cousin's granddaughter, which makes her my third cousin, I think, uh, has an allergy to bees. And, she, and if I use this wax on the spools, she can't, she can't touch the spools. So if, if you know anybody in your life that, uh, that has that allergy, then you should not uh, not use this stuff. Um, it's hard, to, like I say, it's hard to find wax like that. I did find some German wax that uh, that has ammonia in it that cuts the wax, and then when the ammonia dries, the wax uh, fixes to the to the wood. Um, but this, you see what I'm doing here. It's just uh, just brushing it on, and I usually leave it set for 
uh, uh, four hours, four or five hours, and then uh, maybe maybe even overnight. But to speed up the process and not knock over my wax, I, I'll show you that I take a, a cloth and then I buff it because there's a lot of extra wax on there. And if you wait, a lot more wax will soak in than, uh, than I'm allowing for, for right now. But uh, that's, that's all you really need to do. You can still see little puddles of wax like down in the, inside the ear, down in the wing of the nose. Uh, to solve that problem, you just take an old toothbrush and just pull that out of there, pull that out of those spaces, and it actually gets smeared around on the higher surfaces that way. And then you can go back with your cloth and hit those high spots again, recheck it to see if, if you got it all out of the low spots, and uh, you're good to go. Uh, I think that's all I have for you today. Unless there are some questions we can fit in. Did anybody, did anybody pick up any questions? No? Here's one that I didn't go all the way in. If you shine a light up through the bottom of it, you can see it. The wood is so thin here, you can see it shining through the, the, uh, the thinness of the wood. Well, if there's no questions, Blake, I'll just turn it back over to you. All right, Bill. We appreciate you taking time out today and uh, joining us and presenting. Uh, definitely a topic that not everybody is aware of, uh, and hopefully it gives some people some new ideas as far as things that they can carve. So um, thanks again for your presentation, and I'm sure people will probably reach out to you after this is over and ask you about spools and maybe ask you to send them a few. So <laughs> you, I'll got be in touch them. with you, sure. There you go. T Tommy loves them, so she'll be asking. Uh, um. Again, reminder that uh, next week we will have Gene Messer on, on the uh, 27th, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will be off on the uh, 4th of July for the holiday, and we'll meet back up on the 11th. And uh, if we don't have any other questions for Dale, again, thank you, Dale, for joining us. And we'll go ahead and close the meeting out at this time. And uh, Can I ask a quick question, uh, do you mind? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, Dave, there's only a quick question. Thanks again for answering my email earlier in the week, by the way, um, regarding where I sourced the spools. Um, I did manage to get hold of some um, locally after, after all, so hopefully I can get what I had planned done uh, for a gift. But my question was, with, with the eyes, the, the actual pupil, have you drilled a little hole in for the pupil on the eyes? Or have you just, is that just taken out with a very small gouge? Is he still with us? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, if you're still there, you got to unmute. Yeah, I think I've already done that. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. The, the, uh, the demo one that I that I did does have pupils. Those that's a felt tip pen. Right. Okay. That's a sharpie, a tiny little sharpie. Uh, I have tried to drill them. Uh, it's very it's a very delicate process because the wood will tear out. You you you've probably experienced that just drilling a hole in a two by four somewhere. Yeah. Uh, when the drill first starts it tears a little bit of the surface of the wood, which normally doesn't happen if you're going to put a bolt and a washer on it, or it doesn't make any difference. But uh, on, a, on a delicate little area of the eye, the iris and the pupil, uh, that, that's, that's tough to do. If you have a one millimeter dockyard, 
you could give that a try if it's if it's that tiny uh you could always carve gigantic eyes and then you could use larger tools but uh the smallest tool that i would ever try to, to use would be that one millimeter dockyard i don't, I don't know whether there's anything smaller than that but like i say the pupils look very dark in comparison to the rest of the the actual wood that's why i was asking to be honest because i didn't know whether it was a shadow or whether it was like a like a a pen mark or something so thanks for that i appreciate that yeah it's, uh yeah this this big one that i showed you with the open mouth uh it's it's got felt tip right okay tip marks on it too but this one here i don't know whether you can see that with the light probably not it's in the shadow there let me turn it upside down it has holes yeah i can see that there are little tiny dockyard holes in there uh, if I don't think it's gone in deep enough or dark to make a dark enough shadow, it, after I use the dockyard tool, then I'll take a very tiny little uh, drill and go inside the dockyard hole because, you know, I've bypassed the problem of, of starting the hole with the drill yeah. and, uh, and it'll go in deeper then and it'll make it darker. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I have a quick question as well. Okay. Uh, do you do you find that it's more typical in the spools that you that you find that the grain is oriented vertically or horizontally? It's always vertical. Always vertical. Okay. Yeah. Always vertical. That's where it gets its strength. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Dale. Yes. Do you have any Santa spools that you could close by you could show us, or do you just stay away from those? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't catch the first part of your question. Do you have any Santa spools that you could show spool. us? I, uh, just the ones that the, I showed the, you in the picture in the bobbins, the big. Uh, uh, okay. The big so you don't bobbins. do them in thread spools? I guess I could carve one in. Uh, Put it on Instagram or Facebook. I generally don't Ooh, do that. Awesome. Those are uh, those are kind of boring to me. There ought to there ought to be plenty of uh, <laughs> Santa examples on uh, Etsy and Pinterest. Probably Etsy. I don't know. I don't know how you search Etsy, but uh, people are selling that kind of stuff on Etsy. You could probably find good examples. I've gotten several off of Etsy actually and eBay. I've gotten them everywhere, but. Anyway, I, I was just interested to know if you'd had any carved that you could show us. No, I don't have any uh, Santas. Okay, thank you. Okay. And real quick, how uh, thick on average are the um, are, are the stool, spools in the middle? Well, once again, there's such a variety that that you can't you can't generalize and say there's a particular uh, particular thickness. So you can see my virtual background here is not working very good. Uh, here we go. You can see there's there's a difference in these two. Right, this but one, actually when you start digging into the wood about how much, you know, until you get to the actual center, you're like from the center out um, of that smaller spool, how much do you think would be in, uh, available to be able to to carve on of, of this one here yes sir mm -hmm. uh, there's probably uh three eighths of an inch okay i've i've toyed with the idea of making some sort of a uh, a measuring tool that i could run a dial up through the center and then measure from the edge of that dial and and measure the outside diameter of the spool to see how much how much thickness there is left because i i have gotten close to the to the center and wondered about it and then not gone any further because i was afraid that it, that i would punch through well when you're uh, saying about the lighting you know that one was thin enough that you stick a light you'd see the light through i was kind of wondering hey how much do you have to play with really there because i mean that would be really cool to put some lights in behind it and kind of string that up uh yeah it, it would be trickier 
than you might imagine because you'd want the you'd want the wood to be uh, a uniform thickness that you right. that you want the light to shine through. Right. So I don't know how many tries it might you might have to to, to make that happen because you probably punch through it a couple of times before you got a couple before thousand you achieve what you wanted. You're almost better off just to cut it all the way out if you're going to put a light up through it, because then you'd see the you'd see the light inside. So you could also uh, you could also bore the the pupils of the eyes all the way into the the center hole, and then you'd have maybe you'd have a, a little lighting effect through the through the center of the eyes. So that could be spooky. That'd be kind of cool too. All right, that's pretty neat, man. <laughs> okay, I haven't tried that. Let me know. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, a lot of creative uh, spool carvings on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Maybe I'll get some ideas from you. Anybody else? Any other questions for Dan? Okay. Well, we will meet again next week. If you all will go out and share this link with other people and uh, try to encourage people to join us. Again, it's always 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to allow everybody to join, uh, especially people overseas and other parts of the world. Uh, so again, we'll see you all next week. Gene Messer will be on with us, and then we will be off the week of July the 4th. So everyone have a great Saturday, and uh, we'll see you next week.